The staff who remained at the White House on the morning of January 7th knew the president needed to address the nation again, and they had a speech prepared for him that morning, but he refused for hours to give it. As you heard Cassidy Hushin testify previously, President Trump finally agreed to record an address to the nation later that evening, the evening of January 7th, because of concerns he might be removed from power under the 25th Amendment or by impeachment. We know these threats were real. Sean Hannity said so himself in a text message that day to Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany. He wrote, no more stolen election talk. Yes, impeachment and 25th Amendment are real. We obtained the never before seen raw footage of the president recording his address to the nation that day on January 7th, more than 24 hours after the last time he had addressed the nation from the Rose Garden. Let's take a look. Whenever you're ready, sir. I would like to begin by addressing the heinous attack yesterday and to those who broke the law, you will pay. You do not represent our movement. You do not represent our country. And if you broke the law, you can't say that. I'm not gonna, you, I already said you will pay. The demonstrators who infiltrated the Capitol have defied the seat of dust. It's defiled, right? See, I can't see it very well. Okay, I'll, I'll do this. I'm gonna do this. Let's go. But this election is now over. Congress has certified the results. I don't want to say the election's over. I just want to say Congress has certified the results without saying the election's over, okay? But Congress is certified. Now Congress is Yeah, certified. right. Now Congress is I didn't say over, so let, let me see. Go, go to the paragraph before. Okay? I would like to begin by addressing the heinous attack yesterday. Yesterday is a hard word for me. Just take that. The heinous the attack. Heinous attack ah, good. Take the word yesterday, because it doesn't work with the heinous attack on our country. Say on our country. Want to say that? No. no, no, no. My only goal was to ensure the integrity of the vote. My only goal was to ensure the integrity of the vote. On January 7th, one day after he incited an insurrection based on a lie, President Trump still could not say that the election was over. Mr. Pottinger, you've taken the oath multiple times in the Marines and as an official in the executive branch. Can you please share with us your view about the oath of office and how that translates into accepting election results and a transfer of power? Sure. You know, this isn't the first time that we've had a close election uh, in, in this country. And President Trump certainly had every right to challenge in court uh, the results of these various elections. Uh, but once you've had due process under the law, uh, you have to conform with the law, no matter how bitter the result. Once you've presented your evidence in court, judges have heard that evidence, judges have ruled. Uh, if you continue to cont contest an election, you're not just contesting an election anymore. You're actually challenging the Constitution itself. Uh, you are uh, challenging the societal norms that allow us uh, to remain unified. Um, I, I think that um, one example, for example, you've got Vice President uh, Richard Nixon back in 1960 had lost a hard-fought election against Senator John F. Kennedy. Um, uh, uh, there, there were irregularities in that vote, according to a lot of the histories, and a lot of Vice President Nixon's supporters asked him to fight, contest it, don't concede. But in one of his finest moments, Vice President Nixon said no. Um, he said it would tear the country to pieces. 
and he conceded to Jack Kennedy and announced that he was going to support him as the next uh, president. We have a, a, an example of a Democratic uh, candidate for president, Vice President Al Gore, who faced a very similar dilemma. Um, he strongly disagreed with the Supreme Court decision that uh, lost his election bid and uh, allowed President George W. Bush to take office. But he gave a speech of concession in late December, mid or late December of, uh, of uh, 2000, uh, where he said this is for the sake of the unity of, of us as a people and for the strength of our democracy, I also am going to concede, I'm going to, to support uh, the, the, the new president. Uh, his speech is actually uh, a pretty good model, I think, for any candidate of, for any office uh, up to it, including the president, and from any party to read, uh, particularly right now. Um, you know, uh, the, the oath that uh, our, our presidents take, it's very similar to the oath of office I took as a U.S. Marine officer and the, the oath I took as a White House official. Uh, it is to, to support and defend the Constitution. It's to protect the Constitution, to bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution. And uh, it is a sacred oath. It's an oath that we take before our families. Uh, we take that oath before God. Um, and um, um, I, I think that um, um, we have um, uh, an obligation to live by, by that oath. Uh, and um, I, I do still believe that we have the most ingenious system of government on earth. Um, it, despite its imperfections, uh, I don't envy countries that don't have this uh, system that actually allows for a predictable, uh, peaceful transfer of government every four to eight years, and it's not something that we should take for granted. Thank you. As we heard at the start of the hearing, in the immediate aftermath of January 6th, Republican leader Kevin McCarthy understood that President Trump or responsibility for that day and should have taken immediate action to stop the violence. He was even more candid in calls with Republican colleagues. As you'll hear in a moment, recordings of some of these calls that were made were later published by the New York Times, the context for these calls was that a resolution had been introduced in the House calling for Vice President Pence and the Cabinet to remove President Trump from power under the 25th Amendment. Let's listen. I've had it with this guy. Uh, what he did is unacceptable. Um, nobody can defend that and nobody should defend it. The only discussion I would have with him is that I think this will pass and it would be my recommendation we should be done. Um, I mean, that would be my take, but I don't think he would take it, but I don't know. But let me be very clear to all of you, and I've been very clear to the president. He bears responsibilities for his words and actions. No ifs, ands, or buts. I asked him personally today, does he hold responsibility for what happened? Does he feel bad about what happened? He told me he does have some responsibility for what happened. Um, and he needs to acknowledge that. President Trump has never publicly acknowledged his responsibility for the attack. The only time he apparently did so was in that private call with Kevin McCarthy. There's something else President Trump has never acknowledged. The names and the memories of the officers who died following the attack on the Capitol. We're honored to be joined tonight by police and first responders who bravely protected us on January 6th. Your character and courage give us hope that democracy can and should prevail even in the face of a violent insurrection. We on this dais can never thank you enough for what you did to protect our democracy. On January 9th, two of President Trump's top campaign officials texted each other about the president's glaring silence on the tragic death of Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick, who succumbed to his injuries the night of January 7th. These campaign officials were Tim Murtaugh, Trump's director of communications, and one of his deputies, Matthew Walking. Their job was to convince people to vote for President Trump, 
So they knew his heart, his mind, and his voice as well as anyone. And they knew how he connects with his supporters. Here's what they had to say about their boss. Murtaugh said, also shitty not to have acknowledged the death of the Capitol Police officer. Walking responded, that's enraging to me. Everything he said about supporting law enforcement was a lie. To which Murtaugh replied, you know what this is, of course? If he acknowledged the dead cop, he'd be implicitly faulting the mob. And he won't do that because they're his people. And he would also be close to acknowledging that what he lit at the rally got out of control. No way he acknowledges something that could ultimately be called his fault. No way. President Trump did not then and does not now have the character or courage to say to the American people what his own people know to be true. He is responsible for the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. 